Welcome to the Sweet Spot Mini Episode 35. I've been doing these mini episodes now for over a year now. I couldn't believe it. And I started doing these because I wanted a chance to add more guests onto our show. We only do our regular show every other week. So I wanted a way to do this. And this is the easiest way is to do it in a mini form, uh, kind of a rough cut. And we just get it out there and we've had some good response from it. So and this episode, we're going to welcome back someone that we had on our show in 2018. And that is Jason Jensberg of Fake Theme Park. Welcome, Jason. Uh, thank you, gentlemen. It's good to be back. Yeah. I, just, I hate to say it's a hard G, just like uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg or Alan Ginsburg. Ginsburg. Yeah, not, not like the drink. Yeah. <laughs> I like it. All right. Um, <laughs> so we had you back on, and we kind of talked a little bit about um, how you started. So first off, everyone's like, well, who is this guy? So kind of explain um, a little bit about you know what you what you do and how you, how it's how it started and kind of explain to everyone that maybe hasn't heard the episode from 2018. <laughs> I, I, I understand. I'm here to help those people. Yeah. I, I'm the creator uh, of Fake Theme Park, a comedy account on Twitter and Facebook. There's some other material out there uh, on YouTube and things like that. But it's prim primarily primarily on Twitter and then it's uh, Facebook as well. Mm -hmm. And it is a, a loving satire of all of all theme parks. It is a, a nameless uh, a park that's never been named. It's never given a precise location, but it has everything your favorite park has. It has roller coasters, has a studio backlot tour, it has princesses, it has killer whales. It's everything all put together. And it is based on my time as a Universal Studios tour guide. I worked at the Hollywood Park uh, for many years. Uh, mostly as a, as a as a tour guide on the famous tour, both on the regular four car tram and the VIP uh, private trolley, and then a few other things in the park. I hosted the backdraft show, made announcements out front. I was a paleontologist in the Jurassic Park ride for one summer. I worked in various aspects of the park. I met my wife there, a fellow tour guide. We met in the actual break room at Universal, nice. and um, so I. I I grew up with I, I I love Universal. I, I this is not some kind of uh, you know, savage uh, takedown of it. It, it is uh, making fun of the, of every aspect of it, both yeah. the employees, the management, the uh, the guests. I think we all know certain guests that, that can be you know so love parks so much they kind of hate them. Yeah, love them so much they're kind of crazy. So that I embrace all that and make it uh, something that hopefully we all everyone can agree on. It is not uh, I have no agenda. This is I'm not trying to be you know, mean to the parks. Right. It is a loving parody that I've been doing uh, every day for we're, uh, over 11 years now. I mean, in case anyone was wondering, listening, going, he doesn't literally mean every single day. I mean, literally every single day since July 2010. Wow. Uh, so it has been quite, quite a journey, and that is why, unfortunately, very soon it is ending. Yeah. Wow. What a run. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how you kept coming up with such um, original things and, and, and very funny things, I will say. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah, it was based on uh, first my own experiences of being a, an employee, also just a guest at various parks throughout my life. And then uh, you know, my, uh, I'm on Twitter, so I have an incoming feed. Mm -hmm. I also follow a bunch of the theme park news and blogs, all the official accounts, so I get material from them, uh, even as things were sort of slowing down a few years ago, then the pandemic hit. Mm -hmm. There was all kinds of new material to mine. Even just over the last uh, the last 10 years, Harry Potter had just opened when I began the account. Oh, yeah. um, Star Wars came along, and Disney did not own Marvel and Star Wars when I started this in 2010. So there's been a lot happening, and the pandemic was a gigantic event in all theme parks around the world. So there's always been something to make fun of. <laughs> um, but after this long, I... I'm beginning. It's also every year it gets farther, and farther away from me being an employee, yeah. and so I feel like I'm sort of less, less qualified to do that now. I haven't been at theme parks as often. I, I, I live in Manhattan now. I'm not near any parks, so yeah, I think the time has come to, uh, while while it's still fun, mm -hmm. while people are still enjoying it, to bring it to a close rather than wait for it to get to be not fun, not funny. No one cares anymore. No one's following it. Right. Just kind of quietly, slowly let it die. That's not the way to go out. No. Did did the pandemic make it harder or easier to come up with material, or it didn't really affect it? 
It was because for uh, yes, it was hard because it was all the, the typical jokes of well, this ride is down, there's a long wait time, and we you know the con candy's right. gone stale. This is the bad version of all. You don't haven't followed it. There's much better jokes than what I'm saying right now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but all that stuff was gone. There, there was, you know, for a while, the parks were not open, so anything about the parks exist, you know, being uh, sort of in the present tense, I, I couldn't make a joke about because my you know my park. My unnamed park follows the real events of the world. Mm -hmm. That's kind of the point. It kind of reflects what's going on. So I could talk about, say, animated movies and then, you know, being going to conventions or things like that that were outside the park. Mm -hmm. uh, I could still make fun of superheroes and, and space films that were uh, related to the parks, actually, their IP. But yes, it's interesting. I couldn't talk about, like, well, this ride is down. That was just for a while, there was no, there were no rides right. doing anything. So I'll be about about reopening and employees having COVID and all the, all those issues are going on about when do we reopen and what are the protocols in place and yeah, what, yeah. Say, what are the various state governors are doing and things are going back and forth. So that became a, a, a rich mine uh, for, for parody and until they started open. Even now, there's still questions of what of what's going on in the various states. Right, so yeah, it's yeah. it's still unfortunately it's still relevant. <laughs> And I think in the beginning, no one knew what was going on, and and there was you know do this, don't do this, do this, and I think that gave you an opportunity to take that and run to you know. And be... Yeah, it, this was an unprecedented event in, right. in theme park history. I think Disney had closed only a few times, like September 11th, yeah. and these ran. And this this is you know weeks long, months long closures. So a huge event that I was there to to make fun of, which <laughs> to make, to bring some joy, to bring light. Right, make light right. I don't, again, I'm not making fun of the parks closing was the right thing to do. I'm not against that. Yeah, yeah. I think they reopened too quickly. If anything, I have to, my point is they should not be reopening uh, because it is just unsafe and it seems like that it may be borne out. But yeah, yeah. Uh, they're open, so I will I will roll with that. <laughs> what? When we had you on last time, you had mentioned your name and that you were part of fake theme park, but we was there a time where people didn't know it was you that was behind the the account? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I to, to go back to the beginning when it all started, I was um, working in a social media. So after I left Universal after many years, I had a job at a social media agency. This is still in L.A. Uh -huh. We had a bunch of entertainment clients like Hope Shopping Network and Paramount and CBS. And I'm making comedy videos and all kinds of social media marketing and learning social media. This is still a new thing back then. Right. I mean, I'll, I'll, I, won't even lie, I won't even be coy about it. I'll tell you, this is early 2008. Wow. Um, so, you know, so, you know, Obama had just become president. That's how far back we're going. So uh, Twitter was, was new. Um, Facebook had just opened up to the public. And Facebook, you know, which was just for colleges at first. It wasn't just anybody could just sign up. First, it was just Harvard, then Ivy League, then all the colleges. So we, were, we weren't even on that yet. We were still dealing with Twitter and MySpace wow. was still a thing for, for, for marketing, like for serious, like viral marketing and social media, yeah. or MySpace groups, MySpace pages, not, not so much the personal accounts. So I was learning social media along the way. That's how I managed to get uh, my Twitter handle was at Ginsburg. That's how I got my last name because no one was, no one cared. No one was bothering with Twitter back then when you could you could get a handle. So I just got my name. No one had it yet. I didn't get at Jason. Someone got that first. Uh, but so I was doing all this social media stuff, and then eventually the recession finally caught up with that agency. Uh, and I was laid off. A lot of us were. So I was sitting around all the social media knowledge. I had this comedy background. Uh, I was studying theater at USC. I was in comedy troops. I had uh, went through the Second City Conservatory program in LA. Wow. And I was sort of looking around and saying, well, there's a way to do comedy on Twitter now that I know how to do it and now that it's becoming a thing. And it was at the era back then where a lot of accounts were anonymous, a lot of accounts had fake in the name. And the idea was like, well, who are these people? Is it, is it someone, is it an insider? Really, you know, actually is tweeting about the inside things happening at their at their business or their government. It was all kinds of, right. all the anonymity was so interesting. So I thought, well, no one's making fun of theme parks. So, I mean, Disney has an account, Disneyland has an account, and Universal does. Mm -hmm. But there's no, where's, there's no sort of comedy version of that. Especially back then, because a lot of the parks were very conservative in in their their tweets and now universal orlando you know is always is, is crazy yeah but not back then they were not they were just like marketing standard very very anodyne safe things about the park and park hours i thought well i can why don't i, I have all this knowledge of universal uh -huh. um i enjoy my time there but there's something funny to make fun, make fun of both the employees up to management the unions the guests everything yeah, yeah. so I began tweeting, just, just, just on Twitter, it wasn't even on Facebook at first, and I decided to be anonymous. So I just used the name Fake Theme Park, uh, and never named, I, it wasn't like Fake Disney, it wasn't a fake, an actual park, it was my own park. 
my own attractions, my own princesses, my own characters and everything. So I do whatever I want. Yeah. So early on, I decided that you can't say, like, oh, the King Kong is on fire. Well, it, it's not. So what is what is the point of this? Where I can say, I, my part, attractions would always be on fire. Right. I can have all kinds of problems that are not reflected in reality. So a lot more freeing, in a way, to make up things and just do whatever I wanted. Mm-hmm. So, yes, for a long time, I was I kept at it because the people begin – would contact me on Twitter and Facebook and go, are you a manager? Are you in Orlando? <laughs> what Are you a Disney person? And it was kind of like, well, this is sort of a fun mystique yeah, to yeah. keep this up. To say I was, again, by that point, a non-employee living in New York, mm-hmm. well, that doesn't sound very fun. So I kept it a secret yeah. to keep it seem like people had no idea. And then finally, I realized it might be better to get my name out there and get a little bit of credit. Yeah. I wanted to release these books and my, my name on them. And, you know, eventually you have to start filling out paperwork. And if you're getting money, you can't be totally anonymous. So I revealed myself. And it was a big deal, uh, if I may say so. The Orlando Sentinel covered it. They put me in print, not just on the website, right. in the actual newspaper. Yeah. I have a copy of it. So a lot of podcasts and bloggers like yourself had me on to talk about, hey, now who is this guy? <laughs> now he's not just playing a character anymore. Who actually is he? Well, I remember listening to Season Pass podcast, and you went on as um, <laughs> as uh, who's it? Who's the president of the? Uh, yeah, Murph Gantley right. is the founder and CEO. Yeah, that was of the, funny. The park. That yeah. was a lot of fun. It's the only way I could appear in any way was to do that and do a character and, and do do comedy, which is my first love and what I have all this experience in. So I was under the crotchety old. Uh, is a cross between um, I don't know P.T. Barnum and Mr. Burns from The Simpsons and <laughs> Groucho Marx all put together as sort of this money grubbing awful evil rich guy yeah. who hates everyone. So that was the only way I could appear on a podcast was to make up. And even when I when I did that, I would use a burner app on my phone. Uh-huh. I had an Orlando area code on it. I never identified myself. I have a fake name park Gmail account. I was an anonymous account to track people by email. No one ever knew. I wasn't like, well, didn't someone? I didn't trust anybody. Did one blogger, one podcaster could ruin the whole thing. So I didn't tell any. So did 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 Doug and the guys at Season Pass know who you were? No. Oh, that's. I, funny. I, I emailed them cold. Uh-huh. I emailed them out of nowhere. Cause I was the first people I ever talked to. I liked their podcast, <laughs> that's, that's and just classic. thought I'd give it a that's shot. Yeah, they, they took a that's risk been, with me, and I, I owe them forever for that. I think I've been on six times. I think since then, yeah. it's been. Uh, yeah, that was just out of the blue. I thought, can I? I remember a funny email on, like, on behalf of Murph, like his assistant, and filled up a bunch of jokes and said, "This thing exists. I'd love to talk to you." Uh-huh. And you know, I could sort of make fun of them. Yeah, because <laughs> Murph is so horrible. He was like Don Rickles, sort of working in the crowd, and uh, I got to make fun of them and their podcast <laughs> and my own park and myself. And that is so good. I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wow. <laughs> oh, that's good. Ken, did you have that any is questions? You guys have been covering it all. <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I, I just, I don't want it to end. Yeah. I mean, maybe you could be like the Main Street Electrical Parade, and you can keep coming back. Yeah, <laughs> I've thought about some way of. There's, there's no way to do. You know, what one thing I want people to know is the accounts will stay up. I'm not just going to delete the account forever. There's no point to that. Yes. It'll be on Facebook and on Twitter if you want to just scroll uh, and just read things that you are welcome to. If it's, if scrolling is a bit too taxing, a lot of the best content are in the books, which you can purchase on Amazon. Uh, they are in paperback, they're in Kindle, and Kindle Unlimited. If you're limited, it is zero dollars. So you get it for free, I get nothing. Uh, maybe I get something out of it, deal. <laughs> but uh, there is, I have for the best, the best posts, as well as original content that is, is too long mm-hmm. for a tweet, a thread, or a Facebook post. There's, there is, it's not just the retread of all the tweets. There's all kinds of other stuff in there. Uh, two different books. One has Halloween, one has Christmas, one has a Merv Gantley interview, one has a Princess Rainbow interview. So they're, they're different, but kind of complementary. And uh, it's sort of, this is the best of that are available for those of them are not going away anytime soon. They, they're one tiny way I make a little bit of money. Yeah. Because apparently Twitter is free, <laughs> and yeah. I don't get anything out of tweeting multiple times a day for 11 years. So you, so you were doing it every day. Did you have a whole bunch lined up that you knew ahead of time, or were you coming up with them like the day before? Uh, I did use scheduling. I should yeah. say the present tense is still going on. I use scheduling software, uh-huh. uh, Hootsuite. I'll, I'll give them a plug. It, I, there's a free account with Hootsuite. Uh, I think TweetDeck is sort of the more popular version, but it's like TweetDeck. It's not, it's not owned by Twitter. Right, right. And so I could, when I went on vacation or something, yes, I wasn't necessarily tweeting from my, you know, 
uh, wherever I was. Mm-hmm. I could schedule things in advance, but still had to sort of monitor were people talking to me? Did something go viral? Did something did something happen? People wanted to ask me a question about it, so I wanted to be sort of on call. And with a with a smartphone, that's not too tough. So I would check in, right. but I wasn't necessarily yeah hitting tweet hitting like enter every single you know, every well, every was four times a day at the mm-hmm. the height of it. And I still had a job and stuff like that. But I could easily take a few minutes to go over to Twitter and do things for the day and then then come back. So, yeah, scheduling software yeah. saved me. And when I went on vacation or whatever, when I was sick, don't worry. I wasn't necessarily killing myself to do it. <laughs> but I wanted to make sure there were things. Again, that's not just once a day, multiple times. Yeah, like, yeah. People have different schedules, different coasts. I understand that, living on both coasts. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, I went, went the extra mile. And not only would you post something, but you would also um, respond to – you know, people's reactions or, or, you know, people would respond to your tweet and then you would respond back to them too. So it was a carried on conversation sometimes. Um, yeah, was it was fun, fun to yeah. interact with people. I love when people uh, would uh, actually ask questions because we would basically set up for a punchline. Yeah. People would just talk to me. Uh, and what I really loved is people will would know the canon if I can be use such a presumptuous term. But anyway, I, I have certain princesses. Uh, the rides have certain names. It is, I'm not just making it all the time. They they're so eventually people seem, seem to learn them uh-huh. and would refer to them. And that means oh, you're paying attention. You read that. You read that far back and know it. Maybe it warms my heart. Who can ask whatever they want, of course? Right. But if they actually mention Chaos Coaster or Princess Snowflake, it's like ah, you actually somewhere along the way you remember that name and are referring it back to me which is just the best compliments i could get yeah but i was happy to talk to people i will i'll still do it until the very last day to interact with people because that's 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 what that's twitter that's part of the fun oh that's great well i enjoy looking forward to you know seeing those every day i'll look and see what what's going on today you know (laughs) <laughs> that's that's very yeah, kind. I'm I'm glad. It's nice to hear that. Every every like, every retweet, every comment does mean something to me. Uh, I you know, I'm a performer mm-hmm. at heart, and this is very interesting because Twitter and Facebook are silent. Yeah. The only time I ever hear laughter is talking to guys like you. I can actually hear a laugh, uh, or being Mark Antley making people laugh. So it's nice to the only thing I don't get applause, I don't get laughs, mm-hmm. I don't get a lot of money, but a, a retweet, a like, a share, those really that that's a. Uh, that warms my heart. Well, I could, I could relate to that because I'm a musician and um, playing. You know, you get an immediate response, like you said. And mm-hmm. when we do podcast, you know, I'll get comments sometimes. You know, it's just <laughs> it's a little different. But. <laughs> <laughs> right, but anything, any, any engagement, we call it. I'm right. happy. That means people people like it and responding to it. Mm-hmm. Mostly, I find it seems to be. I did not set out to do this, but the, the theme park employee community, both current and former, mm-hmm. seems to really enjoy it. I meant it for a very general audience. It has never quite hit that level of popularity. You can look at how many followers I have on both accounts. Yeah. I'm not, this is not anything new. But it, people that are working there and have worked there seem to know, seem to I feel like I get it. Um, I, I, gotta, I don't have, feel I have any special insight after being gone for so many years. But I did, I did work there for a long time mm-hmm. at a major park, at a major attraction. Uh, and so I, I'm, I feel good that I've made, made their lives a little bit more joyful because it can be tough. Oh, yeah. As you know, working at a park, no matter what you're doing, no matter how glamorous the job, if you're playing a character, playing Spider-Man and everyone loves you, it's still tough. It's still hot. There's still unions and there's still the, the corporation looming over you. Uh, so I'm, I'm glad that I managed to connect with them. <laughs> I like today's the celebrity sighting in the park today. That was funny. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, so, so your books, and you also wrote some songs, right? Or the lyrics? Or a, an absolute one of my uh, yeah, like a bucket list sort of thing mm-hmm. to do was, uh, I, and I, I even though I worked at Universal, I'm still a Disney fan, and I lived in LA long enough to have been to Disney parks enough times. And uh, let's face it, Disney is where. Everyone, if you think theme park, everyone thinks Disney, and the, the parody is sort of a different level because Disney is such a such a managed brand, right. so it's it's even easier to, to deflate it. Whereas Universal is you know is, is crazy these days in there, so it's hard to, harder to get at that kind of what the angle is. But anyway, mm-hmm. uh, yes, yeah, so one thing Disney is known for. One thing I love about Disney are the songs. Yeah, I'm a huge fan of all the Disney musicals and even weird songs from the park like. America, the Golden Dream, and Universe of Energy, and all those the Figment song, things like that. I I, I own them. I love them. Mm-hmm. So I thought, well, that's something else like a parody. And so I worked with two different composers. Um, they were paid. 
I like them making it known. So we're the singers. And uh, co- yeah, they wrote the songs. I, I, I gave them lyrics. We worked on the music together. So I co-wrote them. I, I guess I have co-writing credit. Right. And one is a parody of a Disney princess anthem, which I'm very proud of. That I even became a music video, yeah. which is a whole other way of bringing the park to life. That was fun. Yeah. And the other one is a parody of the Mickey Mouse Club March. My version of Mickey Mouse is Jimmy Jaguar. The Jimmy Jaguar Club March, which is all things you have to do to join the club, which is very complicated to join the club. It's quite a lot of steps. It's an entire song's worth of steps. So, uh, yeah, I have two people singing the songs. There's a music video for them on YouTube, and that was a, a, almost a dream to write a comedy song with a real musician and, and, and have, it, you know, have two real singers sing it, in one case, have it come to life on video. Uh, that was uh, one of the great benefits of doing something like this, was to branch out and do something crazy like that. Right, right. That's great. So, any any well, you, uh, you I guess if you did have plans, you may not announce them. But do you have any any? What are you going to do with all this free time now? <laughs> <laughs> well, I have other uh, yes, I've done other projects. Even since, I have I have a full time job. I work in television. Okay. But I've other I've been still working other things. I've written a few independent films that have, have gotten made and not my own. I was hired to write them. Mm-hmm. I've done some web series like I did back in L.A. Um, for uh, one for Playboy, one for Science Channel. So I am pursuing other writing projects right. that I guess I'll have more time to devote to them. I've been doing it all, anyway. Faith Teamer doesn't take that much time out of the day. Right. It would be nice to not not have to think about it. Yeah. I do think about it throughout the day, so I'm able to focus just on those sorts of things, other bigger writing projects that might you know, get pay more you, <laughs> as well. You can't, you, can't, you can't fool me. I know you're starting up a fake streaming service. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fake theme park plus. plus I, guess. Yeah, yeah. I, think, I, think, I think it already exists. They may have made that joke once or twice okay, <laughs> when Disney Plus first launched. Yeah, um, yeah. Yep, yep. So, so that's uh, so. Yeah, it would be nice to have some free time, and I'm certainly going to miss it. Again, like, I'm ending it at a time when it is still fun. Mm-hmm. If you are still following and still care, if people like you still care. Yeah. So that's I think that's the right choice, but it means it will be even more sad when it's not just like oh, I'll just stop doing it. Who cares? To make it a big deal, to make an announcement, and kind of have this countdown. Right. But uh, the park, I, I, people, people get said to me, so the park will close, right? The park, or the park's gonna, you know, it, the park will burn down, and the <laughs> Princess Rainbow will be homeless, and Murph Gantley will go bankrupt. And I, I said, that's not, is that comedy? That doesn't sound very funny. That sounds kind of sad way to end. It. Yeah. So that will not be happening. There's not the park's not going to burn down. I don't think the park's even going to close. I think the park will still be out there in our collective imagination so yeah. to give you bring you joy and comfort when your job at the theme park is going poorly you can think of fake theme park what's happening at that park so the idea that it would it would all collapse upon itself and be a, an earthquake will claim that it'd be a giant sinkhole <laughs> i don't want it to end where it's just sort of gone that doesn't seem yeah like a fun ending so i think the idea will just sort of it's like a favorite TV show that ends with like, well, it's just it's just an episode. There's more episodes we just haven't seen. Right. Having more adventures we just don't know about. Wow. So so Mur- so Murph is not going to wake up next to Bob Newhart. <laughs> right. I get that reference. I'm old enough. Yeah, it won't be. It won't it'll take place I, inside a snow I'm globe. I'm sorry. I, I'm I'm, um, I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll throw you saying elsewhere as well. Yeah, there won't be any kind of a uh, trick like that. I'm, I'm not quite sure what the final, final tweet will be. Obviously, as we count down, there'll be some celebration. I finally have a hashtag about it. I'm doing more interviews. Uh, we'll do a Reddit AMA. People can ask me all kinds of questions. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'll, I'll answer any of them. That's, that's the whole point of an AMA is answer, ask anything, and I'll, I'll try to answer. So I'm not quite sure what the final, final tweet will be, but I just want to end on a, too much of a sad note. That yeah. doesn't seem not quite in the spirit. Uh, of the park, how I want to leave people. Yeah, for sure. Well, one more time before we go, um, plug your your books um, so everyone can go check them out. Oh uh, yes, I we, we tricked by I think I think Fake Theme Park myself will do it. If not, it's my name, Jason Ginsburg, G I N S B U R G. Uh, but the first book is called "If the Princess Rolls Her Eyes, Your Wish Will Come True," uh, and the second one is called "You Must Be This Tall to Exit the Park." So look for those bright, bright colors. One's bright purple, one's bright blue on Amazon. Again, you can get it in paperback. That's fine. Have it shipped to you. It is on Kindle. And if Kindle Unlimited, if it's Kindle, it's $5. If it's Kindle Unlimited, it's $0 because it's just part of your subscription. And again, it is, it is the best posts uh, of various categories, uh, not just all random things. They are by, by category. One's animals, one's Halloween, one is all sci-fi. Mm-hmm. And then there's also original content, a timeline of the park. There's some interviews that are just too long for a Twitter thread or anything that are written just for these books. So please, if you feel if you've enjoyed 
Peking pork over the last 11 plus years and want to throw me five dollars, uh, that would be great. Yeah, for sure. All right. Well, thank you for coming on, Jason. Appreciate it, and thank you for bringing us uh, laughter for the last 11 years. <laughs> That's very nice to hear. It's my my pleasure to talk to you guys again and, and share my love uh, of theme parks and and this account.